right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Corning Museum of Glass and our very special uh, late show this evening. Hopefully you're also joining us online. We've got people from all over the world tuning in for this very special program. And brought to you here is Heather Spiewak. She's gonna be our master glass worker, so let's give her a thunderous round of applause and encouragement. She has been very excited about this piece, and we are all very excited to have you with us for this very special piece. She is one of our gaffers. She is here working every day, doing demonstrations. She's been with us for many years, so it's really a wonderful opportunity for us to feature one of us um, out here on the stage. And of course, we've got the full team with us here today. She's got a lot of helpers um, coming in, because she does have a very complicated piece in mind, something that we don't get an opportunity to do during our regular uh, scheduled programs. Uh, these evening programs, the late show, and especially these live feed uh, programs gives us an opportunity to really focus on some more intense glass blowing. So it's really a great day to join us here at the Corning Museum of Glass. So we've got uh, Dane Jack, we've got Jared Rosenacker over there, we've got Fredericks joining us, and Aaron Jack, and my name's Helen. I'm going to be narrating for you for most of the program, and then also here to answer any questions. So let's get a big round of applause for the whole team, shall we? Fantastic, fantastic. So um, Heather's been hard at work actually for uh, many, many days, many day, uh, weeks actually, uh, working on all the parts that are gonna come together uh, for tonight's piece. And it is one piece in the end, but it's gonna be made of at least four parts. She's gonna be doing what we call an encalmo. And uh, the very basic encalmo is just two bubbles that are joined together to create one bubble that has different hemispheres. So we actually have quite a few encalmos down here, the red or the orange one, the green one down here, uh, this blue and white one. There's, it's such a fun uh, process uh, that we really love to do it all the time because it is an opportunity to create completely different designs in different parts of a vessel. Now she's made a beautiful illustration of uh, part of her design here today, but it's going to be made of not just some simple bubbles, but bubbles that have been created with beautiful patterns. Uh, some of you might have had an opportunity to see our cutting demo that we have up on the West Bridge here in the museum during the daytime. And she's been learning how to do a lot of cutting and engraving. And so uh, every single bubble that she's made that will be joined together has actually been carved into beautiful patterns. And so we're gonna start out just by picking up a bunch of these um, blanks, we call them blanks, um, and those blanks are going to be made into cups or tubes and then joined together to create one big bubble that will be blown out into the big vessel that you see over there on the uh, illustration. So this should be a lot of fun. And again, if you have any questions as we go along, please let me know what we can do to answer the questions. Um, I'll be narrating on and off throughout the evening, um, but we're also gonna try to give some open space to that narration to maybe even get a chance to hear and listen and watch the team working together. Because that's one of the exciting things about not only working here at the Corning Museum, but also just working in glass in general is that beautiful, collaboration that happens between all the glass blowers as they're out here working together um, and we've got a great team to highlight with us he, this evening so all of the glass you can see um, Dane has one of the blanks right here these blanks uh, imagine them as a bubble of glass and if we start with that bubble of glass we start with a chunk of color now all the color comes by adding metal oxides and compounds into the raw materials of glass to create the various colors. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the colors later on, but we've got um, a layer of color on the inside, first off on the pipe. Then we gather over some more clear glass, and then we gather over a little bit more color on the outside. So each one of these has at least two different colors on them with a, bit of little, a little bit of clear in between. That way, if the color's on the very outside, when you carve into it, you're actually taking away some of that color and leaving a space because the clear underneath it leaves a gap and then you can see through that like a little window into the color below. So it's very similar to these vessels that you see here, carving into the surface and you can reveal the inside color once it's been blown back out. 
So each one of these, I don't know what all colors she has. It's like a whole rainbow of colors. I'm sure it's gonna be beautiful. So she's got all of these different blanks um, carved up and ready for that internal and that external layer. And they all just have to be joined together. So to help pick up that blank, she starts out with a little bit of clear glass on the hollow stainless steel blowpipe. Even though we have a blank already made, we need to be able to blow through it again. So she made kind of what, it's like a glass donut on the end of that pipe. We call that a collar. And so by having that little collar, she's able to attach that um, bit of glass to it and then have the hole, the pipe, already still open so she can get it hot enough and start to inflate that blank. We're gonna have some really great camera work here tonight as well. So you really wanna pay close attention to not only the live action, but some of the close up shots that we'll get in our cameras, because they're gonna show you some of that beautiful detail that's kind of hard to see from far away. But you can see all that beautiful carving on the surface and that collar on the tip. And it's just gonna take a little time to melt all these in. You can't make it too hot too quick you can't make it too cold too quick. If glass changes temperature too rapidly, it's going to crack. And when it's end up um, in this state, you don't want to get it too hot or it'll just melt all of those beautiful textures out. So it's going to be a delicate balance of trying to make sure that she can get it what we call fire polished, getting everything nice and soft without really melting out all of that texture. But we've got two blanks. We're just going to have four total. And right now they're sitting in an oven over here on the far end of the stage, little black box. We've got another one over here with some spares, just in case. We've got uh, backup plans if necessary. So she's got a couple blanks in there, a couple blanks in our original um, oven. And those are basically glass babysitters. And so the glass has been created, cooled down, carved, and then put back in that oven and brought up really slowly. She loaded all in there last night, actually, to make sure that it would be all ready and go nice and slow. And now it's sitting at around 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a safe temperature for glass. It's not going to get um, too hot and start to change shape, but it's not going to end up cracking. And so it's all sitting into that oven, waiting for it uh, to be used. And when we're joining all of these bubbles together, um, we need to create tubes and bowls, essentially. And so whatever's closest to her pipe, the first thing on her pipe is gonna be the very top of our vessel. So we need to make that into a tube. So she's poking a hole through the end of it. And so just poking with the tweezers, creating a hole on the inside, and then she'll open that up to be the size of the lip of the next piece that gets joined. If you don't have the right sizes, they're not gonna join cleanly and you'll have holes and you can't blow anything up if it's got a hole in it. So you need to make sure that it seals really well so they'll be working together to create those even seals. Does anyone have any initial questions about that process so far? Okay, again, let me know if you do, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, it's really hard for me not to talk too much, but I'm gonna try to leave some space in there so you can listen um, into the team, especially when they're joining these things together. Because it's gonna be quite a, a ballet, quite a dance between all the glass workers coordinating together. Now part of what makes this dance go so smoothly is that they are all very talented glass workers uh, in their own right. There's no one here that has less than seven years of experience on the team. We say it takes at least five years of experience just to even understand how the material works, how to turn your hands, how to recognize the temperatures, be able to make basic shapes. And so Corning hires a, a professional artists to be up here on this stage. Now we all learn a little bit more on the job, of course, through experience, but uh, they hire only the best. So we got a really great team for you here tonight. Now instead of just eyeballing, she's getting down to using calipers. This is really helpful in making sure everything's just the right size to get that joint nice and clean between the two.
components. I already love that vessel in itself, even the carving, you can start to see it softened up, starting to get more translucent. It's gone from that rough cut that's basically like a sandblasted surface and a braided surface you can't really see through, but it started to heat it up and soften, and all of it's getting back to shiny glass, and you can start to see through it in that underneath uh, design. And we're just using a wood paddle to make sure that it's nice and flat. You also want to make sure that these lips are not too thin. They want to join together. And she wants to blow this out more once the whole thing is joined together. And so you want to make sure that you're not joining really delicate parts. You're joining more solid bits of glass. That way that they have a nice clean seal and a little bit of structure to be able to really push and pull and inflate on this vessel to make it work. And when glass is fresh out of the furnace, it's very hot and liquid. But it would be very difficult to try to join two liquid pieces together exacting. So when we go to do this joint uh, combining of the two bubbles, you'll notice that it's mostly just the lips that will be glowing, the edges of those bubbles that will be glowing. That way, those two are hot and they stick together. It's really up to Dane to stay nice and calm, get just the right temperature. If he starts spinning really fast, he'd actually start moving that away from center. It'd start opening up like a plate or a platter and change the dimensions which have been set in that piece. So you've got to be really conscientious um, in both the heating and the turning and the movement. Every movement the glass worker does translates into that material. We'll have all sorts of social media posts of this piece tomorrow. Let me come out there and listen uh, so I can get your question. How do you get the cut marks? Yeah, so engraving of glass um, can be done in a couple different ways. Um, one, you could just take that bubble of glass and mask it off with something that's fairly resistant. Even electrical tape would work, something kind of solid. And then you cut away the design that you want to be a hole in that piece, and then you can use a sandblaster to just blast away that color, leaving that shape. If you want to uh, go across the street and make an object like that for yourself, we actually have that as part of our hands-on projects across the street. You can end up sandblasting an object with designs. Um, now, the other way and the way this was created was actually introducing the object to a wheel. And the wheels that she used are actually a diamond impregnated metal. Um, but traditionally, it was all stone wheels. And so you would have a stone wheel that was in a particular profile, whether it was kind of a lens or a curved shape if you want to make a round circle, or it would be a V pattern if you want to make a deep, brilliant cut. And so you would just introduce the glass to that wheel, and it would abrade away the design on that surface. Now, if it's all clear, you just get a beautiful design. If it has color, you're going to carve through that color and reveal the underlying layers of that color. And so uh, lots of potential for that. And uh, again, if you, uh, we, it's finished for today, but if you are with us, you know, the tags are good for two days. You can come back tomorrow. We'll have a cutting demo actually happening up on the West Bridge, and you can uh, get an opportunity to see some live cutting, which is a special thing just for the summer. We don't normally have that here, so it's just uh, a nice addition to our summer programming to see that live cutting. Here we go, the join. Oh, they faked me out. It was just a price check. <laughs> just making sure that the two were the right size. Um, and then they'll go for their final heat. 
So it's always good to have uh, double check it, make sure that it is the right size before you go to commit, and make sure then you have the temperatures that you need to join them together. You can see she's really just working with the torch to heat the very lip of that piece, making sure that the two areas that will join are hot, but nothing else is that hot to move and misshape. Beautifully done. Very nice. One down. Yeah. So, yes, you got a question. Do you ever get burned? Is that the question? Oh, yeah. That's a very popular question. And the answer is we do get burned um, on occasion. It's usually fairly minor. And uh, most often, it's not the glass. It's the metal. Because when you're looking at pipes and punties, you're looking at irons that are very hot, but they're not glowing. So it's very difficult to tell when the metal is hot. Um, so a lot of times we'll end up touching a pipe in the wrong place, maybe even grabbing it in the wrong place when we're first starting out, or even leaning back and kind of touching your knee to the pipe. That's a good common one. The metal jacks that we use can also be very hot. And so a lot of beginner glass workers will have like what we call little tiger stripes on them where they've touched the blades to their arms. Um, but you, do, you don't end up burning yourself very often once you get to know the material. Um, but it does happen. You got to be kind of tough to be a glass worker. You're going to get cut. You're going to get burned. But it's all worth it because it's such a fun material to work with. All right, so you can see we've got a beautiful joint between those two. So she's going to take a little time to really get those hot, really meld them together, marry them together cleanly um, before we can start to add our next bubble onto the end. Yes. Yeah, so the, those bubbles were at room temperature yesterday. So is there a time where the glass can never be put back in the oven? Now, um, I guess that could be a couple different conversations. So let me cover a couple of options. Now, if you have a piece of glass and you're making it um, and you no longer can fit in the oven while you're reheating it and forming it, um, then you could run into problems. Because this particular glass is soda lime glass. It actually has a pretty big expansion contraction rate. So that means you have to keep everything hot, even if you're making one area really hot to form it. And so you'll see as we're working, she'll be going in and out of that secondary furnace quite often. Not, o not always to make it molten, but just to maintain a minimum temperature. So yeah, if we make like this a big platter like this, and we get it to the point where we finish it off and we spin it, and it makes it a huge platter, and there's no way to reheat it, then we better put it away really quickly into the annealing oven. And if you can fit it into the annealing oven, then it can cool down really slowly under controlled conditions and survive. Um, but if for some reason you outsized your furnace or your reheating chamber or your annealer, then that piece would most likely be lost because you can't, um, you have to cool it down really slowly. Now, if you're making a, a piece that is a component, and this is what she's done, she's made four components, um, you can heat and cool those kind of as many times as you need to. But every time you bring it up or every time you bring it down, it's, it's a risky game because if, you, if it goes too quickly, or if something happens to the oven and it shuts itself off or something, if it's in those critical ranges where the glass will crack, there's not, nothing you can do to repair that crack once it's happened. So the, the risk factor goes up, I guess. But if, if she wanted to make a series of these that had 17 connections, she could make them throughout a whole month or a whole year and collect little pieces. Or if I wanted to make a flower that had a thousand petals on it, I could spend weeks making all those petals and then warm them all up together and then start pulling them out and reattaching them to a sculpture or an object and kind of build from there. So absolutely, it's a great way of working actually, um, especially if it's a very complicated. And you can see this oven right here, this odd shaped one here. 
is what we call a garage. And like your garage is at home, it's meant to just forget about things, right? You just pack it full of stuff and you forget all about it. So this is actually got a hot side near the, um, the, the flame and then a slightly colder side. It's only a few, few degrees different, but it's a stable and a little bit warmer. So we can load things into there and it'll keep them safe, warm, and happy as we're working. And then when we go to pull it back out, we'll put it on the hot side and then bring it back in and introduce it to that project. So if we don't want to bring it all the way down to room temperature, we can also just store them temporarily in a hot oven and then join them together even on the same day. Yeah, good questions. So this is some really good teamwork here. You can see Aaron's turning the pipe, Frederick's blowing into the pipe. Jared was shielding her from the heat, um, reflecting off that material, and then Heather can really concentrate on watching it expand, holding the folded wet newspaper on there to help contain it and be able to really focus on the shaping of that object with all of that teamwork in play. Now, one of the critical steps in glassworking is to make sure that when you break the bubble later, and you need to break it, you need to separate it from that blowpipe, you want to make sure that it breaks where you want it to break and not catastrophically into the piece. So every piece you make will end up having a tight line cut in it at the very top. We call that a jack line, and that constriction line gives a weakness to the material and give it, gives it uh, an ideal place to break. Because glass will break wherever it is the weakest along a form, and so we want to put a weakness so that it'll break cleanly. All right, so I got a question from online here, and I'll give a shout out for, to all our online friends. We have almost 200 people watching you, Heather. Woo! Yeah. Ooh, Miss Catherine Ayers is also tuning in, one of our other gaffers here. Um, so the question online was, uh, it, how quickly does the glass cool down when you're working with it? Well, there's a lot of factors that go into uh, how hot the glass is and how quickly it cools down. I think the two biggest factors would be how hot it is when it started and how thick or thin it is then while you're working it. Because of course, thin glass will lose its temperature very quickly. Thick glass is, has more thermal mass. It'll hold its temperature longer. And different colors can actually react to heat differently as well. So we have soft and uh, stiff colors. Usually it has a relative uh, connection to the type of color that it is, whether it's a dark color or a light color. Just like t-shirts on a hot day, you're going to be wearing white if you want to reflect the heat. You're going to be wearing dark black if you want to absorb the heat. And so those colors can also react to the heat slightly differently. Um, so that's part of the trickiness of blowing glass. She can't really see the thickness of this vessel right now as she's working, but she can watch it and see, well, does it start glowing right away? And then it stops glowing right away in one particular area. That's a pretty good indication that it's lost or it's gaining temperature and it's pretty thin. 
If it seems to take longer to get that glow and it holds that glow for longer, chances are it's pretty thick. And so she can use those visual cues in addition to the movement of the material to really get a feel for how that glass cools. But for our glass, it's molten in the furnace at around 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit on a daily basis. We keep that going all the time. And that's about the consistency of honey. But when it gets closer to about 1,000 degrees, it's not really gonna move anymore. It's pretty stiff. Still seems pretty hot, but that's almost scary cold for glass blowers. It's never gonna move once it's there. It takes upwards of 11 or 1300 just to even barely get it trying to move, usually using some sort of force like tools or inflation. Good question. So keep those questions coming online. We're happy to answer them as well. Send some good comments and positive feedback for uh, Heather as well. Ooh, yeah. So what is it about paper that makes it a better tool to shape with than any other tool that we have? I would say the closest answer to that, we have the folded wet newspaper. That's what's in her hand right now. And it, it's folded up and then it's uh, burned in. Obviously, the surface is a bit of a carbon layer. And then it's actually soaked in water. So it has a small amount of steam that forms between that tool and the glass that keeps it from sticking. And I think what makes it the favorite tool for most glass workers is that it's the closest you can come to touching the glass with your bare hands. We never touch the glass with our bare hands. That's a really quick way to get a burn. But you want to, as a maker, get in there and really touch the material. And so then beauty of that newspaper is that it can be infinitely flexible, just like your hands. So if you fold your hand together or if you leave it wide open, you can push with your thumb, you can curl in with your finger, you can even pinch between two fingers and get an indent in your vessel. And so it's a very direct contact with the material and a very versatile way of um, adjusting that shape, cooling that glass when you touch it, and helping um, contain it when you're trying to blow something out. You could push with it and it'll blow out other places, or you can uh, kind of just guide it along with that paper. Yeah, good question. So Dane has picked up another piece over here. And this is actually going to be the foot of our project. And so uh, I'm going to drop just a little bit of clear glass into the center to add um, a nice landing pad for what will be our punty. This will just thicken up the material, give it a nice place. You can, I can see that there's a layer of color pretty much on the inside as well. So we don't want anything that's going to break away that color. So by coating it with just a little bit of clear glass, it'll help protect that layer of color that she has on the inside. But right now, Heather's just maintaining temperatures. She's already got it blown out. Kind of looks like a beautiful Easter egg right now. I love it. And then we're going to marry these two together, not lip to lip like the other Encalmos. This is actually going to be the foot of the vessel. So just attaching that together, maybe with a little glass, maybe with the torch. I'm not sure which approach she will take to join these together. Hey, Heather, do you have a bit of rainbow on the inside of that piece? Hey, Heather. We'll have to get back to her on that. It almost looks like to me that the inside of that top 
um, bit of the vessel has multiple colors on the inside. Now, none of these colors are going to look themselves until they cool down again. When the colors, uh, when the glass is hot, uh, it reflects the heat from that material. It just shifts the, the, the color ranges. And so everything will be a lot duller today than it will be uh, when it cools down. She said it is a bit of a rainbow, yellow, gold, green, blue. So a bit of a rainbow of jewel tones on the inside with a yellow ochre on it as well, which is a really nice um, kind of medium tone. So this, when it's finished, we'll, um, of course, have lots of social media uh, posts about this particular piece. So you'll want to keep an eye out on our uh, Facebook page, Instagram. All these will have a picture of this final piece. Because um, this will probably sit in the oven for quite some time. So we might not actually have it out for tomorrow if you want to come and see it. Uh, it would be very late in the day, if not the next day uh, to be able to take a look. So check, keep an eye out on all of our social media. We've got them all. And you'll have lots of opportunity to see the finished project and some of the highlights. Taking lots of good photos tonight as well. So Amanda's here. Yeah. Amanda's taking lots of social media pictures for us. To anyone who might have joined us a little late, we've got Heather Spiewak here making this beautiful Encalmo engraved uh, vessel here for us tonight. She is one of our gaffers. She's been with us for uh, many years, worked a lot out at sea, and also has worked with us here at the museum. She's grown into be a very skilled glass worker, so it's a really wonderful opportunity for us to feature one of our own here this evening. We also have quite a team uh, coming together to assist Heather tonight. Got Aaron here helping turn pole on the bench with her. Fredericks, our intern for the summer, he's out here helping out as well. We have a second bench going with Dane heating up that foot and Jared helping out on that second bench as well. My name's Helen, if you got any questions. Lots of questions, all right, what can I answer? That is an excellent question. Wanting to know, one of our young visitors here says, all these pieces that are down in front, were they made by a group of people? Now, we do have some very simple pieces, and we do have some very complicated pieces. Uh, but every single one of those was made with at least two people. So we have our teams that come for uh, our regular shows and things. And some of the, the smaller pieces were all made during our regular programming. And that's at least two people and a narrator. Um, some of the more complicated pieces, like our bunny here, those might have taken a couple days of making parts and then maybe have three or four people working together. But generally, glassworking is a team activity. If you want to make complicated things, you definitely want a little help along that way. It makes it a lot easier and just a lot more fun, like most things in life, to bring some friends along. Nicely done. Now we've got our foot. Yeah, you can give him a round of applause. It's been a while, right? We're never going to turn down positive reinforcement. <laughs> got to show the love, folks. Fo show the love. Absolutely. So now we've got three out of the four. We've got the vessel itself pretty much complete. We've got the beautiful foot with all that texture still in it. Didn't melt out all of that texture from the carving. So it shall have a real nice tactile quality to it. Um, but now we still have the top section of this piece to make, the neck of this piece. Um, so that's going to require actually repunting this onto a whole nother 
punty. That first punty that was used just to transfer that foot was actually fairly delicate. And we wouldn't, wouldn't be able to support the weight of this piece and really work with, work with it ergonomically um, without a slightly larger punty. So they're just going to make sure this is lined up, make sure it's nice and secure, and then we'll transfer it off of that original blowing iron onto its final punny to shape up the top half. So you can see the pipe that Dane has for that final transfer is a pretty hefty one. You always want to be size appropriate to whatever you're making. We spoke earlier about being able to reheat things as you're working. If you can't reheat it, you can't complete that work as you make it. Um, you also don't want to end up putting something on a really delicate pole that would be not enough balance to be able to control it. And a slightly pipe, fatter pipe is going to be much easier to turn and manipulate on that future connection. Now Heather's doing a lot of heat maintenance here. Not only is she using that secondary reheating furnace to keep everything warm, she's also brought a torch into this situation. The torch allows her to spot heat specific areas. So yeah, we just had a question online asking how long we were going to kneel this piece for. I would say a minimum of 24. We might put it on a little bit slower. 36, yeah. Safer the better. Would you take 22 hours to bring the, the, uh, the piece up? And well, with all the carving and everything that she did on all the parts, she went very, very slowly to bring it up. It's about 22 hours to bring it up to the temperature that we're picking it up in, which might be generous, but when you're working with something that has so many hours of labor into it, you just want to give it time. There's no rushing any of this stuff. And we have plenty of ovens here, so we can let it cool down over long periods of time and not take any risks and give it plenty of time uh, to cool down. Especially when you have a part that has a foot, any connections, delicate connections, thickness differences. Um, those are really complicated pieces to actually cool down properly. This glass cools based on its thickness, but also on the complication of the form. This is a really critical uh, timing and temperature between all of the team members to make this happen successfully. You see Jared's even reaching in with uh, Sofietta to blow air on that punny just to make sure that it's nice and stable. Just got the torch going to make sure the top isn't too cold. And then using the diamond file, probably a damp diamond file so the water curls is just a little thermal shock right along that jack line. Light taps, all it took. Beautiful job. Woo! And a sigh of relief from the team, I'm sure. Successful transfer, beautifully executed. Oh, now we can see the top of that design there, Heather. Look at that gorgeous image on our screen there. Really showing all of those carved lines. So every single line that you see 
was painstakingly laid out and then carved away with diamond wheels all through those thick layers. Her blanks were actually very textured, very deep uh, texture cut into uh, those forms. Another question. We got a comment online from Heather's father who says he's super proud of you, Heather, and so excited to be watching online. That's fantastic. So we do have these live feeds that happen on occasion. Keep an eye out on the website. It'll tell you um, the next upcoming. We have visiting artists coming in. Uh, um, very frequently throughout the summer that we do these late shows every day, but then we also do these live feeds uh, that gives you an opportunity to watch from far and wide around the world. And if the timing doesn't exactly work out for you, uh, if you live on the other side of the world and you don't want to get up or go to stay up that late, um, keep an eye on the YouTube channel. They put eventually all of the videos onto that YouTube channel so you can watch at any time at your convenience. And so you could just spend the next year of your life watching glass blowing from Corning, New York, and all the fun and exciting things that have happened here uh, and probably never have to repeat a video. We got lots of wonderful resources. So that particular tool, it's called a Sofietta tool, and it's basically a replacement blowpipe. You might have noticed when she sealed up the top of that hot bubble, blow air pressure into it, it grew. And so once it's been removed from that blowpipe, that's the only way to really add more pressure. And if we're making a form, anything that we can do to let the glass do what it naturally wants to do, you're going to get a better um, effect from that. So letting gravity elongate pieces, letting inflation make them bigger, or if you're doing something like the big platter, using centrifugal force to open it up wide without physically touching it. So all of those are really, way, really great ways of uh, harnessing that natural tendency of the material um, and working with it. And that's what takes so long. I think a lot of beginners, they work with the glass too cold, they don't quite understand how to let the glass flow and work with it. And so it really shows the talent and the experience of the team and of Heather here to see everything going so smoothly, really coming together, letting the glass blow out. When you've got different colors, the colors are all moving different in the heat as well. So it's a lot of attention to detail to get it to blow out uh, quite so perfect, perfectly as what she's been doing here today. So it looks like Dane has picked up that last component, which I imagine is the neck of our piece. Catherine says hey as well. Got a lot of fans out there, Heather. So I know we do have a lot of viewers from um, far and wide, but if you are in the region or willing to take a trip, we are definitely a place to be this summer. There's lots of fun activities um, here at the museum. We've got a revamp of our Crystal City Gallery and really celebrating 150 years of glassmaking coming here to Corning, New York. Um, not only here at the museum, but we also have um, a glass blowing studio on a barge this summer. And so keep an eye on the website as well. You can follow us throughout the canal system of New York. We just 
finished our Hudson uh, River area, and now we're actually in the canal system of New York State, traveling uh, to many venues throughout the summer, um, doing demonstrations and glass blowing on that barge, uh, which is a really fun and exciting program just happening this summer. And here we also opened the uh, Glass of the Architects exhibit. It just opened a few days ago. It is beautiful. Definitely worth a trip in to see. And if those of you in the area, definitely come and see. If you think you've been here before, you've seen everything before, it's not true. There's always something new and exciting happening here uh, at the Corning Museum of Glass. Definitely a great place for your family to come and visit. Even the children, lots of children's activities in our innovation stage. We have a brand new presentation uh, the story of the Crystal City, which also helps celebrate our uh, existence as a glass community, tells a little bit more about the history of uh, Corning um, as that glass uh, center. You can always make your own if you're excited by watching Heather make this beautiful project. We not only have make your own and ability to um, make something while you're here to visit, but we also have longer term um, classes and workshops. And so you can come to learn how to be a glass worker, just like Heather, right across the street at the studio of the Corning Museum of Glass. And I think almost everyone here is probably taking a class over there at one point. And it really is a, a world-renowned center for glass. Educators from all over the world come to teach and learn in that uh, facility right here, uh, sharing our grounds. All right, got another one online. The infamous question, how do we get a camera inside of a 2,000 degree oven? Anyone else wondering that? Yeah, quite a few of you. I should have covered this earlier. So inside that furnace, we do not have a high temperature camera as much as we have a high temperature resistant piece of glass separating that camera that's located behind it. Now, our glass is going to melt at 2,000 degrees, so we don't want to end up having standard glass. So instead, it's a window of fused silica in the very back of that oven. We've got a great visual here of that connection of the neck piece, that final blank for our uh, vessel. Oh, beautifully done. Very nice. But yeah, that inside view that you're seeing, you can um, look right inside that oven. There's a camera located behind it, and that specialized glass that separates it is called fused silica. Um, and that is a specialized glass that was actually developed back uh, in the 30s by Corning. And even today, as we speak, they have formulas of glass, and they're tweaking those formulas and then testing that glass that re is a result to figure out what it can be used for. So the chemistry behind glass, you change its formula, you, working, you change its working properties. So some's more thermal resistant, some's more uh, uh, translucent, transparent. You can have all sorts of different things that can uh, create new working properties. And they didn't quite know what to do with that glass when it was invented. But it was eventually used in the space program. And they used it for little windshields in the space shuttle. Because it was a high temperature glass that was optically clear and allowed it to re-enter the atmosphere with a good view. And we've got a tiny little windshield right there in the back of our reheating chamber. If you are in the front, you might even be able to see that little square in the very back, um, this little black square. Or really, really, it's a rectangle in the very back of that oven. But this is something that's really kind of unique to Corning as well, getting that inside view of the furnace. Now the top of this has a little more glass than what Heather needs. So she's gonna coax this open, maybe even trim away some of that excess glass 
but by using the torch, she can really focus the heat only where she wants to change it and not lose all that beautiful texture that she has painstakingly carved into the top of that vessel. Now, a big vessel like this is also uh, maybe a little taller than she could reach out. So this is a really great demonstration of, again, t that teamwork, turning the pipe and her working from the outside of the bench. Beautiful teamwork there, very nicely done. It's hard enough to try to cut the top off a vessel when you're turning the pipe, let alone having someone else turn the pipe, coordinating together and having just the right temperature to make it happen. Even by the time that little trim hit the floor, it was cold. So she needs to cut quickly to get it to uh, cut smoothly. Um, Dane was shielding her thumb because we're looking at temperatures of maybe 1600 degrees or above to get that glass to be able to be cut. And so you can imagine how much reflective heat is coming onto your thumbnail as you're trying to cut through that glass with shears. And so very, very well executed by the team. Usually good assistants are of course good gaffers themselves and we've got a very strong team up here tonight. We've got Aaron helping turn the pipe here Frederick's opening and closing doors. We got Dane running back and forth all over the place, picking up new parts, putting things together. And Jer is also on that team helping out with the torches. It's a very important job, making sure everything's all maintained, uh, the proper heat to make sure it's all successful. So it wouldn't be possible to make this piece without such a talented team. Any other questions we can answer for anyone? Yeah, so we got a really popular question here. It's already wanting to be purchased by a member of the audience. Is it how much would this cost when it's finished? Now here at the Corning Museum of Glass, we do sell a lot of glass in our marketplace and we represent artists from all over the world and especially a lot of people from our team, but none of those pieces were ever made here on the stage. So anything that you're seeing made during a demonstration or here during um, regular uh, demonstrations will never be sold because they're all priceless. They're here just for entertainment, education, and for the experience of making these pieces um, and uh, here on the stage. So you'd have to commission Heather to do one later, which I don't know if she'd be able to 
do that or not, but that would be a lot of, as you said, it's a lot of labor goes into this piece, a lot of uh, factors, hiring the team, getting the everything set up, so it would not be an inexpensive piece, but it'd be worth every penny, whatever she would charge. We, we don't end up making any commercial glass here. What you see is all been made for demonstrations, and so uh, we don't end up making necessarily the same thing over and over. We have an opportunity as gaffers to make whatever we want because we're not creating a product. Um, if we were making a product, that means that every single show that you came to see would probably be the same piece over and over and over. And we want to make sure to invite everyone to see something new every time they come to the Corning Museum of Glass. So uh, yeah, we might have a lot of production available for sale in our marketplace, um, but that's never the case down here on the amphitheater floor. Yes. <laughs> yeah, did Heather pick her own team or was it whoever was around that day? Um, I would say it's a little bit of both, but she lucked out that she had a lot of her friends already on the schedule, but she did arrange uh, to make sure that she could bring in a couple extra people, because normally we would only have three people on the stage for this evening's show, for the late show. And so we needed a few extra people, so we got, um, were able to bring in a few extra hands to help her out on this really exciting and very complicated piece. So we got a little online question about um, our machinery um, being the reheating chamber, wondering how long does it take to get hot and to cool down? Um, our furnace in particular uh, that holds our molten glass is never turned off. So it actually takes a couple days to bring up to temperature, get full of glass. To do it any faster would cause thermal shock and cause cracks to form in the, in the uh, furnace itself. Um, the reheating chambers, however, those do get turned down every night. And then we flip on the switches that light them up in the morning, and it only takes about an hour to come up to temperature to get ready for the day's production. Um, what was the second one? The, the refractory bricks, how often you have to replace them? Um, not very often, uh, but it depends on the usage and how abusive everyone is on the equipment. But generally, our furnaces are going to last around 10 years. The, re the reheating chambers get periodic. Uh, repairs and updates, especially the doors get replaced periodically uh, because they do end up cracking and getting um, uh, little chunks falling off of them every once in a while. Um, but for the most part, um, this equipment stays fairly stable and we use it every single day. So I'm already seeing the silver suit come out, so that must mean that we're getting very close to the final moments of this beautiful piece. Now, Heather's done this uh, uh, long-term project. Uh, I've seen her working very hard over the whole last uh, week, making all of the blanks, layering up all of the color, masking off her projects, carving them all by hand to create all the beautiful patterns that you see. And then, of course, assembling the team here today, bringing up all of those blanks overnight, and then painstakingly putting them all together to create this final one piece, four different bubbles joined together to create one final vessel, each one having a layer of white and then all kinds of beautiful colors layered up underneath them. So you'll definitely want to tune into that uh, Facebook, Instagram, all the things that have pictures here, the social media, to take a final look at this piece. Um, probably not tomorrow. It's going to probably maybe take up to a week to get it back up on an image but we'll definitely have it online and available for viewing. But we've got this silver suit out. Dane's all dressed up, ready to put this away. We're going to load this away in an annealing oven. And we're going into this lower one here, right? So we need to cool this down really slowly. As glass cools, it actually shrinks slightly. And that means if there's any thick areas and thin areas, they're going to shrink at different rates. That would cause stress to form in the piece and cause it to crack. And so we want to let it cool down really slowly. Um, probably take about 36 hours to let this cool. 
Heather, we're going in this lower one, right? Now, Dane's put on some protective gear, including uh, Kevlar gloves that allows him to actually hold on to this very hot glass. It'll be just above 1,000 degrees when we go to put it away. He also has the silver suit to keep the reflective heat off of him, keep him calm as he reaches his whole body into a 900 degree oven. And then the face shield to, of course, protect his face. Putting a little bit of water on that connection, that punty connection to separate it. We're going to go ahead and torch that back together. Just using a little bit of concentrated heat on that torch, remelt a little bit of glass, get it to stick back together. So great teamwork, instant action there to get those parts back together. Absolutely. So again, this is Heather Spiewak. She is one of our uh, gaffers here at the Corning Museum of Glass. She's worked with us for many years. It's really wonderful to get an uh, opportunity to let her shine here tonight. Uh, this is a really beautiful vessel that she's put together in this live feed. Definitely check out um, online. She has a few other uh, live feeds that she's done with the You Design It program and other things uh, with Corning Museum of Glass. You can find all of that on the YouTube channel. Aaron Jack doing a lot of pole turn in here tonight. That is a tough job, keeping that piece moving and on center and working with everyone. So yeah, big round of applause for Aaron. Jared Rosenacker's done a fantastic job here helping uh, shield, torching, helping monitor, really helping uh, keep an eye on everything as it comes together. Dane Jack working on putting this piece away, but also in the final assembly, picking up those pieces, making sure they're just the right size. important to rebalance those temperatures uh, of that piece, making sure everything's just right. You can really see those beautiful carvings all smoothed out. I love that she's left the texture on the top and the bottom. Nice contrast um, between the smoothness of the vessel itself. But I can't wait to see all the colors come out of this piece. Now these are wooden paddles that she's using to help shape up that glass. That's a material that's not going to shock the material, the glass itself. Wood is a really wonderful tool we use very often here in the hot shop. It's 
It's even warming those paddles up a little bit more. They won't end up shocking the glass. When you get down to these final moments uh, before putting a piece away, you really are into those critical temperatures. There it is, the little above and below to really force that back onto center. And again, we do personally invite everyone online to come and visit us here at the museum. Lots of things uh, to see and do, and keep an eye on that barge project as well. We've got uh, lots of stops along the canal system this summer, blowing glass out on the waterways of New York, celebrating 150 years of glass making here in Corning. And it really is bringing us exactly to where we are today, doing fantastic uh, demonstrations like we are here today, bringing glass 150 years ago they may probably never imagined uh, such imaginative, beautiful things happening for the public and uh, really what a beginning it had for a great history of glassmaking here in Corning, New York. You can still see it's just a little wiggly. Need to make sure it's just the right temperature. There we go, beautiful. Right into our oven it goes for safekeeping. Let's give it up, Heather Spiewak, everyone. Beautiful job, fantastic piece. What a lovely night here in the hot shop of the Corona Museum of Glass. Thanks you all for uh, joining us online as well. And those of you here live action, we're such a privilege to have you with us here today. We hope you enjoyed your day here at the Corning Museum of Glass.